Uh, welcome here. I'm excited today. We're doing the third part of our three-part series with the English Language Arts Council of the Alberta Teachers Association. Uh, so far, we've done a series on uh, middle school books your kids will love, uh, picture books for K-5 to classrooms, and today we're joined by uh, Kevin McBean, who's going to share with us uh, some graphic novels for high school students. Welcome here, Kevin. We're excited to have you. Great. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Chris. It's, it's really great to be here and to talk about graphic novels, which uh, I'm really passionate about using in the classroom. Uh, as Chris said, I teach high school and I've been using graphic novels in my class for the last few years. Uh, and I, I do it as a unit of choice. So I allow students to uh, choose their own. And I found that that's been really successful and that in the two or three weeks that we spend on the unit, um, students are able to read uh, tons of graphic novels. It kind of restores their love of reading, their confidence in reading and gets them really excited about uh, the rest of the year. So I find it's a great way to start off the year. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few different titles today. And I'm also gonna share uh, later in a link, uh, a link to uh, a presentation that I share with my own students that has about 65 different graphic novels in it that I have on my shelf that um, I love sharing with them. So don't feel like you have to be uh, scribbling down notes. You can uh, definitely go back to that presentation. And it has links to the, the Goodreads reviews as well, which I find helpful for students to kind of uh, take the presentation and manage it themselves after I give my recommendations. The, the first book that I want to talk about is called Almost American Girl. And uh, in Almost American Girl, Robin Ha um, sort of presents the story of herself as a young girl growing up. Um, uh, her name is Chuna, is her Korean name, in uh, South Korea with her mother. And she's fiercely proud of her mother. Her mother's a single mom. She's raised her by herself. She runs a successful business a salon. And uh, Chuna's really happy with her life in South Korea. She has a great group of friends. She has a sense of belonging. Uh, and she really feels at home. And then Chuna's mother announces that the family is going to be moving to Alabama, where she intends to uh, marry an American. And so Chuna's life is kind of thrown upside down. So she arrives in Alabama, she finds herself just really displaced culturally. Um, you know, she's struggling to learn English, and she's feeling like a real outsider. And uh, Eventually, as she kind of connects with somebody who shares her love of comic books and shares her love of drawing, um, Chuna, you know, finds again that place of belonging. She adopts the name Robin, and she starts to really feel comfortable and at home. And this book resonates with so many of my students who have uh, immigrated to Canada as newcomers themselves or, or whose parents have um, and have, you know, gone through that similar experience of, of trying to fit in and learning a new culture while still kind of, um, you know, being who you are and being proud of that. So uh, it's, a, it's a great novel accessible for uh, probably, you know, grade eight or nine uh, and up. Bloom is a, a super cute, um, uplifting kind of novel, which is a really nice treat, I think, as high school teachers. Sometimes our students uh, you know, joke and ask us, why do we always study depressing literature? And it's really nice to give them uh, a story that isn't depressing at all. So uh, Bloom centers on Ari, who's the young protagonist. Um, he, his parents are, are Greek Americans and they own a bakery and they expect that Ari is going to take over the bakery. Uh, but Ari has other plans. He wants to move to the city. He wants to start a band with his friends. Uh, I mean, he essentially just wants to live his own life. And so he agrees that if he can help find uh, a replacement for his position at the bakery, then his parents should allow him to, to go ahead with his plan. And uh, enter uh, this dreamy new replacement at the bakery who Ari quickly discovers that he has a bit of a crush on. And as he teaches um, this young man, you know, how to kind of be, be a successful baker and, and take over, um, you know, love kind of blooms in the air. And, uh, and it's a very cute sort of, you know, early first crush kind of first First relationship sort of book. Um, so it's all about, you know, finding your place in, in family, um, you know, being true to who you are, finding out who you really are and, and being comfortable and making that uh, first move uh, that I think a lot of high school students resonate with. So I would definitely share this with uh, any high school student for sure. I am Alfonso Jones. Um, is uh, in, in some ways a really tough read and, and in some ways I think such a necessary read right now. It, it's reminiscent of, of so many of the stories that we've seen in the media um, about the um, killing of, of young black people. And 
uh, in particular, I have a few quotes up here from um, two of my Black students who, who said that this book just really resonated with them and their own experiences. And um, in I Am Alfonso Jones, we meet young Alfonso Jones. He's excited. He's going to be playing uh, in the play Hamlet at his school. He's out shopping for a suit. Uh, you know, he's getting ready to tell the girl that he has a crush on, how he really feels about her. And um, in, in this incident that resembles so many incidents that we've seen, uh, an off-duty police officer um, may, mistakes a hanger that uh, Alfonso is holding as a gun and, and shoots him and he dies. This happens very early in the novel. And so Alfonso wakes up in this sort of afterlife and he's on a train and he sort of meets um, a number of people, historic people and, and more recent uh, people who have been victims of brutality, black um, you know, police violence, and kind of uncovers their story. So there's some nonfiction elements to it as he explores the really complex social and political issues. And, um, you know, it, in, in some ways educates the readers and, uh, you know, in some ways just makes us feel uh, a whole flurry of emotions. So um, every student, I think, has really enjoyed this, um, you know, regardless of, of black or white or, um, and, and I think that for them, it really kind of puts into perspective the importance of Black Lives Matter movements that are happening, you know, in, in our schools right now, which is great. Um, in George Takai's They Call This Enemy, um, we, we hear the story of um, actor George Takai, who played Sulu in uh, the Star Trek. And uh, this is, of course, his, his memoir, his true story. He grew up um, for a time in a, a concentration internment camp um, as an interned Japanese American. And so we have the really heartbreaking look at how his family uh, and, and other families in his community were displaced, uh, how they had their businesses taken from them, um, how they were left, you know, given really no choice but to move to these internment camps and how the parents worked to try and normalize this for their children so their children had a sense of, of their own childhood, um, you know, and, and didn't feel like they were living as they were as prisoners. Um, so it's very emotional, you can see in the panels on the side, um, just the, the beautiful artwork, I think, really captures the, the emotion of this experience quite well. And I think it would pair nicely, um, you know, for any junior high or, or high school teacher, uh, you know, as students are learning about uh, things like the Japanese internment and, um, you know, other historical wrongdoings that uh, Canada and other countries have participated in, I think that this would provide a nice narrative perspective for that. So I would recommend this for anyone in, in junior high or high school. Fun Home is uh, another memoir. I think there's something about the graphic form that lends itself really well to, to memoirs and to telling your own story, um, which I think also helps students. I, I, I use this alongside um, you know, personal writing units. And I, I found that in conjunction with graphic novels, the, the writing I think has really been amplified as students kind of plotted out using graphic techniques and then um, experiment in telling their stories in graphic and uh, regular prose forms. Um, I think that the depth of storytelling in my classes has really increased. So in Fun Home, we have um, Alison Bechdel, who uh, was already a really renowned cartoonist. She had um, been publishing a series of cartoons called Dykes to Watch Out For for many years, and when she published this novel in 2011. And uh, so she looks back on herself as a childhood. And uh, as, a, as a child, she um, was, you know, what would often be referred to as a tomboy, and she refers to herself as that. But um, for her, I mean, it was just sort of, you know, she was being who she was. And, and that didn't sit very well with her father, who liked things to be kind of just exactly so. Um, you know, he liked his family to be very put together. He was very interested in restoring antiques and restoring old houses. Uh, and, and we soon learned that he probably was suffering from um, some mental illness as well that um, really marks Ali's childhood as um, you know, quite distinct. And so the story is told over three different time periods. We have Ali as a young girl, we have her in um, sort of university, and we have her as, as sort of artist Ali. And uh, as she looks back, she, she um, you know, as a university student, she comes out as lesbian. And when she does that, her father actually comes out as gay at the same time. And so this is something that she thinks is going to bring them together. Um, 
but then shortly after he dies, um, possibly by suicide, possibly by accident, it's quite ambiguous. And so she's trying to reconcile herself to his death, to his coming out, to the relationship that she wished they had, but they never really had, um, the complicated relationship that she has with her mother as well. So there's a lot going on, a lot of layers in this. Um, it was also turned into a Broadway musical, which has an excellent soundtrack, and uh, I've recommended it to a number of students who have read this and, and they've really enjoyed. Uh, and it's also on the, um, Alison Bechdel's on the list of IB authors as well. So if you're teaching the IB program, this is a good option for that too. And I would definitely recommend it. There is some mature content, so I would not recommend it for anything under, um, in probably grade 11, grade 12. In the best we could do, um, Tibui um, reflects on her parents' journey after the, the fall of Saigon in the Vietnam War, uh, or the American War, as uh, it's called often in Vietnam. And uh, her parents um, leave, they escape, they move to America. Uh, and so she's kind of trying to retrace this journey and she's trying to figure out, you know, what her parents had to go through um, to understand a little bit what she had to go through. Um, the, the style, as you can see, is really beautiful. She uses this sort of watercolor sepia tones that capture this sort of, in some panels, this nostalgic memory factor, and in other panels, um, sort of the horrors of war that kind of cloud and oppress everything uh, in her memory. And so as she sifts through this, we, as readers, get a, a really personal understanding of um, you know, how that war affected so many millions of people and, and the lives that were, you know, completely broken and, and then rebuilt um, following that. And uh, particularly for, I know, high school teachers, a lot of them teach um, uh, The Things We Carried by Tim O'Brien, which uh, are a series of short stories that focus on uh, the war in Vietnam, but from an American perspective. So I would certainly recommend something like this would pair nicely with that uh, to provide an alternate perspective from the, the Vietnamese perspective um, to kind of amplify that story a little bit. Uh, in The Magic Fish, um, we meet young Tien, who is also a, a young Vietnamese immigrant. And um, Tien is uh, really excited. There's a dance coming up at school. Um, his mother is working hard. She can't buy him the suit he really wants, but she's patching up some clothes for him. And she's really hoping that uh, he's going to like that. And, uh, and, you know, Tien is really proud of his mother and how hard she works to try and support them and, uh, and loves reading. And he loves listening to his mother recount uh, Vietnamese versions of fairy tales. And so in this, in The Magic Fish, we see sort of a number of different narratives. So we see Tien in, in real time, uh, you know, going to school, spending time with his mother. And then we have a number of smaller narratives that are these kind of fairy tale sort of pieces and uh, that echo, of course, things that are happening in Tien's own life. And one of Tien's biggest struggles um, is trying to figure out how to tell his mother that he's gay. And so he, uh, in one really cute scene, he goes to the library and he's working with a librarian who is just wonderful and she's trying to help him look up this word in Vietnamese uh, and they can't find it. And so Tian isn't really even sure if he can't even find the word in Vietnamese, how he's going to do this for his mother. And uh, it's sort of back and forth through their own storytelling together that his mother sort of realizes without any of them having to say anything, um, you know, that, that she just needs to let Tian be who he is. And, and they find a, a really nice piece there, which is great. Um, I love the story, not just for the fairy tales, which I think, you know, I know so many junior high teachers often do work around different kind of fairy tale units or fractured fairy tales. And so I think this provides a really nice kind of, um, you know, global fairy tale look rather than just traditional Western um, stories that are told. Uh, but I love too just the, the easiness with which Tian experiences this coming out. So many um, young gay novels focus on, you know, coming out as this really awful thing. And I think that this just shows uh, a really nice um, sense of understanding that, uh, you know, oftentimes parents, although they might not have the language for it, are in fact really understanding. Um, here is totally different than, than everything else that I've, I've read really ever. It's, it's much more conceptual. Um, and so it's, um, th there's actually very few words in it. The concept is that it looks at one particular sort of geographic place over a period of hundreds of millions of years. And it kind of goes back and forth 
through time and to see what is it that has happened in a single place uh, in history. So all the way back to the creation of the universe and all the way forward in time, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and so in a typical panel like the one shown, we'll see a single room and there'll be inset panels with different dates of different events that have happened there. Uh, and so each page kind of invites us to consider both change and continuity. So in this one, for example, we see that the idea of um, motherhood and, and a young child, um, that this is perhaps something unchanged in this location over time, despite the fact that it looks very different, the surroundings look different, the clothing changes, um, but that experience kind of remains the same. So it gives students uh, definitely a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. Um, because of its conceptual um, sort of difficulty, I, I wouldn't rec, I, I, certainly a young reader could, could read it because it, it is not a long book to read given that there's next to no words, uh, but to deal with the kind of concept I think um, it might be more applicable for older readers. Uh, the Prince and the Dressmaker came out a couple years ago now by Jen Wang, and I think she actually has a, a newer one out that I haven't read yet. Um, but in The Prince and the Dressmaker, uh, we meet Francis, who is a very talented seamstress and has dreams of becoming, um, you know, a fashion designer. Um, and it's sort of in this kind of fairy tale esque town. It's not really anywhere or any when, but uh, in in this world, Francis is going to be this sort of fashion designer. And uh, she's summoned by an unknown patron who has discovered that she is the best dressmaker in town and wants them to have her make them a dress. And so Francis is um, going along with it because this person seems to be very rich and powerful. And soon she discovers that the person behind this request is uh, no less than the crown prince, uh, Sebastian. And so they form a quick friendship and uh, she is sort of his secret keeper. Uh, and Sebastian really just likes to uh, wear dresses. And uh, what I like about this book is that um, it really allows the character of Sebastian to just exist as he is. Um, I, I mean, so often narratives of, of um, young trans people, um, they, they don't allow for any sort of um, flexibility. That they're often narratives that demand that, um, you know, the trans person commit to a particular identity. And in The Prince and the Dressmaker, really we're left to just understand that Sebastian likes wearing dresses. Whatever that happens to mean for his gender, whatever that happens to mean for anything else, this is just as it is. And so I think that it opens up some really nice conversations about how complicated gender can be, um, but also how simple it can be as well. And, and that's something that I think kids innately get and are interested in talking about um, because they all experience gender in some way. Uh, and so as the story progresses, uh, Francis um, starts to get frustrated because Sebastian is getting a bit selfish and he's not realizing that she too has dreams that she wants to follow. So uh, friendship blossoms, um, possible romance, although it's never really developed too much between them. So it's definitely much more of a friendship focus. Uh, and eventually, I mean, it, it looks like a fairy tale. So you probably can guess that it ends like a fairy tale. But uh, it's quite a nice read and, and uh, certainly would be appropriate for young readers as young as, you know, I would think grade six, seven. And I've had high school students read it, um, you know, just for fun. And they've really liked it too. Uh, Dragon Hoops by Jin Luen Yang. Um, a lot of people are familiar with his American born Chinese um, and, and maybe Boxers and Saints as well. And Dragon Hoops is a bit of a departure from that. It's, um, it's sort of a nonfiction um, autobiography piece of Yang's uh, experience working as a teacher. He, he worked for years as a teacher, um, teaching high school and um, also writing his graphic novels on the side. And one thing that he really struggled to understand at his high school was the culture around basketball. Uh, he never quite got why students and staff were so obsessed with this thing. And so he decides that he's really gonna commit to it and he's going to follow the team. He's gonna get really involved. He's gonna be sort of mentored by the coach in terms of you know, all the ins and outs of the games, really get to know the players. And, uh, and so that's exactly what he shows us in this graphic novel is, is the kind of the team experience of this basketball team in high school and how he comes to really understand and appreciate that. Um, so I think that for students who already love uh, basketball or any other sport, as is common at the school where I teach, uh, or for students who are always trying to understand what exactly is this world of sports, uh, which is kind of like I am, um, I think that everybody sort of really enjoys 
this book. And it gives a new perspective uh, in terms of, you know, what might be worth celebrating about this kind of team sport experience. So lots of fun, uh, a quick read and definitely suitable for junior high students, again, right up through high school. Uh, Una's Becoming Unbecoming is, uh, again, sort of a, a stretches the, the limits of what we might think of as a graphic narrative. I mean, th there is a narrative element to it, certainly, um, but it, it's really about exploring uh, a social issue. And in this case, it's about looking at um, the whole range of attitudes of, of misogyny, and right up to, you know, horrific acts of violence against women. And it kind of looks at how there's sort of all of these pieces are connected from um, you know, from a young age, um, the way that girls are sort of treated and, and gendered right up to, you know, things that we see in the media. Um, and so it follows Una's own experiences uh, of, of being sexually harassed uh, and, and kind of puts this, um, maps it on to looking at um, the Jack the Ripper um, in London, right, who is killing sex workers, and then a number of other kind of from the headline stories. And so as it does this, it explores these really complicated concepts about, um, you know, how as a society we treat women, and, and really demands that, you know, as all people, we kind of reconsider that, because um, clearly for, for the main character here, um, this is not a positive experience. So I, I've had a, a number of particularly young women students who have really gravitated towards this. One who actually wrote her extended essay for IB on this. Um, she, she really felt that this was important. Um, but of course, I also recommend it for uh, my young male readers as well, because it's, it's them that definitely need to be understanding perhaps and growing in their understanding of this issue. Uh, for those who like something a little bit darker, and, and if you teach high school, you probably have uh, a lot of students who love those, um, you know, murder podcasts and, and murder shows, um, and which again, I, I would say this is certainly not for everybody, uh, but, uh, you know, I always have a group of students that that's something that they kind of gravitate towards. They think it's, it's quite interesting. And so this um, novel um, follows um, young Jeffrey Dahmer, who of course was the notorious serial killer, um, but from the perspective of a sort of friend that he had in high school. And, and the, the author is somebody who went to high school with Dahmer, and he looks back on his experiences, kind of treating Dahmer as a bit of a, you know, an outsider, somebody that everyone kind of liked to have a good laugh about a good laugh with. So they were kind of friends, kind of just acquaintances. Um, and he really asks some tough questions about, you know, to what extent these kinds of, of acts, um, you know, come from an innate sort of evil and to what extent the adults in Dahmer's life, teachers and parents, um, maybe really failed in recognizing um, just how much help this young man needed. So uh, it, it's definitely not a book that I would recommend for um, many readers, and then certainly you would need to consider the context. Uh, but, but for some older readers, this was something that really resonated for them and, and that they found quite interesting. Uh, guts, going back to something a little more uh, appropriate for some of our younger readers. Um, Raina Talmeyer, of course, a lot of people are familiar with, and she's written a lot of really great entertaining pieces um, that are great for middle grade students. I, I mean, down to grade four or five up through junior high. Uh, but again, I always think it's worth, you know, when we're reading graphic novels, in particular when students have so much time that we can really read, you know, multiple pieces, uh, I encourage them to read something that challenges them and, and read something that's just fun, right? Because that's what really as experienced readers we do all the time. Uh, and Guts is a story that I think resonates with a lot of students, no matter how old they are. Um, and it's Raina Talmeyer's own experience of dealing with anxiety um, and an anxiety that manifests itself as a sort of generalized irritable bowel syndrome um, that causes her to be very concerned and, and just feel constantly nauseous, feel concerned that she's going to throw up. Um, and, and this is an experience that I suspect, like me, a lot of teachers have encountered in, in students who are increasingly um, presenting, you know, identifying as feeling this way, feeling this sense of anxiety. Um, and so what I like about it is that um, Raina kind of explores how she had to come to terms with this and how she had to find strategies to deal with it. She, 
she accepts the facts that this is probably the way she's going to be. And she identifies even as the author in an afterward that this is still how she feels, um, but that she has to find strategies to deal with that because she recognizes that she cannot spend her entire life um, you know, staying home from school on the couch, not feeling well, that she has to still engage with the world. So I think for students who are looking for ways to do that or, or need to be encouraged to find ways to do this, th um, this might be a really worthwhile read, again, even for older students. In Home After Dark by David Small, uh, we meet Russell, who is um, having a really just challenging time in life. And um, his, his father is, his, his mother's absent. Um, his father is not in a place to be a good father. He's dealing with his own issues of addiction. And so Russell's largely on his own. And, um, he tries to make friends uh, in this new place that he's moved to, but struggles to do that, kind of connects with one boy. Um, and then they have this sort of awkward encounter with each other, um, this sort of pseudo sexual encounter. Um, you know, and, and Russell, um, I, I think both of them feel awkward about it. And, uh, but the other boy um, kind of, you know, it, instead of sort of dealing with it with Russell directly, um, turns into a bit of a bully and, you know, just starts picking on him with all these other boys. So this sort of possible friend now turns into a bully. And so Russell's trying to figure out how to do that, deal with that. Meanwhile, in town, there's all these sort of dead animals showing up. So there's this kind of general unease and, and mystery about who is committing these, you know, small but really sinister acts of violence. Violence. And um, Russell has to kind of figure out how he's going to navigate through all of this without the help of any parents, um, without the help of any friends. So it's it's not an uplifting story, um, but it's also a story that I think resonates with a lot of people who, you know, have felt alone and who have felt like they don't have anyone. Um, he does have, there is hope though, I always tell my students, look for hope because, you know, that's an important thing to find in any kind of narrative. And so Russell is um, taken in by this wonderful couple who, um, you know, treat him like their own son and, and really try and, uh, and help him. Um, you know, he betrays them in, in a sense, but, um, you know, by the end, there's, there's some reconciliation and there's some um, forgiveness both of himself and, and other things. So it's, it's a difficult read, but um, I think a really worthwhile read. And uh, again, the illustrated style, um, that sort of nice brushed kind of grayscale, uh, I think is really evocative and, and really enhances the storytelling. Um, hey kiddo, another memoir. You can tell that there's a, again a theme here. Uh, this would definitely be more appropriate for younger readers again. So um, whereas with the last one, Home After Dark, I would not recommend it for people under um, you know high school age. Uh, hey kiddo is definitely appropriate for junior high students. And um, in Hey kiddo, Jarrett, uh, the author and the character, um, is dealing with um, his mother who has some serious addiction issues. He's living with his grandparents who are strict and stern, um, but loving. And he has to try and figure out, you know, how to navigate that. Um, he's, uh, again, similar to some other ones, a great cartoonist and really takes refuge in his art and, and wants to find encouragement to, you know, to grow as an artist, um, which again, the hope is that we know that he does because he turns around and writes this book. Um, but I, I had, um, and, and the quote that accompanies this, um, one of my students uh, reflected on her own experiences dealing with a parent with addiction issues um, after reading this story. And, uh, and I mean, her, her personal writing was just so beautiful. And so I think it really speaks to how much, you know, uh, a simple narrative like this really resonated with her. Uh, and that's all the books that I want to tell you about today. Again, I have a, a linked presentation that you can access that has these titles, uh, as well as, you know, 50 other titles or so that are in my collection and that I've shared with uh, many of my high school readers. Uh, feel free if you have any questions or uh, want to let me know other graphic novels that you've used that you've had success with, uh, you can definitely email and I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, more importantly, I hope that you and your students really enjoy reading some of these graphic novels. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing these books with us. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to see how 
the uh, the teachers across Alberta respond to this. And uh, as teachers, if you're looking at this, we would love for you to throw in the comments. Is there a graphic novel that you love using with your kids that uh, Kevin could learn from or that other teachers could learn from? So just keep this discussion alive. Uh, as Kevin said, that the, the link to this presentation um, will be found here. So you can take a look at that right there. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, Kevin is a member of the English Language Arts uh, Council of the Alberta Teachers Association. And if uh, literature is a passion of yours or teaching uh, English language arts is a passion of yours, I highly encourage you to uh, take a look at this crew. They are a group of volunteer teachers who are absolutely committed and passionate about English language arts teaching. Um, there's going to be a link to their website here as well. Um, also, I'm going to have this link below right now that's going to show you how you can join the English Language Arts Council. And if you haven't joined a council, every uh, Alberta teacher who is an active teacher um, in the Alberta Teachers Association is entitled to one free council at no cost to you. So uh, if you click that link, it'll take you to exactly how you can sign up for that council. Uh, and if language arts is a passion, we would highly encourage you to be able to connect with the English Language Arts Council. Uh, Kevin, again, thank you for your time and your willingness to share with us today. Uh, we really appreciate this and we really appreciate the time that you took in preparing your presentation for us. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody.